Let's introduce Bruce Sample, often called the Perch Man, the designer who built the Aussie fish farm. Bruce has been involved with fish at a commercial level for about 40 years. Bruce was one of the first to ever spawn jade perch. Bruce's experience has been gained during the commercial development of the Australian native perch industry right from the beginning, when jade perch were first produced. Jade perch are native only to Australia. He was the second hatchery to ever breed jade perch. He was on the first expedition to Central Australia when the first wild jade perch breeders were collected from the Barku River. He has now been consistently breeding them longer than anyone currently in the industry. His role as industry consultant has provided sound cross-sector experience at many levels. Bruce has been the president of the Aquaculture Association of Queensland for over 20 years. Bruce was also vice president of the Queensland Aquaculture Industries Federation. Bruce also sat on a number of government bodies as an industry consultant, including the Queensland Department of State Development and the Queensland Freshwater Management Advisory Committee. This was a body that developed the laws for freshwater aquaculture that the industry now operates under. He was also the industry food safety representative during the development of the food safety laws which the aquaculture industry now operates under. As part of his role as industry leader, he coordinated many major aquaculture conferences and training workshops. Bruce was fundamental in the introduction of the Freshwater Finfish Commercial Hatchery Code of Practice. He also developed several other industry codes of practice in use today, including the Queensland Freshwater Finfish Environmental Code of Practice and the Queensland Aquaculture Food Safety Plan and the development plan for the Queensland native freshwater fin fish industry. Bruce is a consultant for clients in many countries including Singapore, Hong Kong, Laos, China, Holland, the USA and Malaysia, as well as many clients in Australia. He teaches all aspects of aquaculture, including hatchery and farm design, food safety, environmental best practice, spawning, harvesting, handling fry and table size fish. Everything from building an efficient functioning farm through to delivering the finished product to the consumer. Special training videos are also available that can be used to teach staff all aspects of breeding and growing jade perch, even designing the hatchery and farm. G'day, I'm Bruce Stamble. Some people call me the Jay Birch Man. I'm often asked by people who are already in aquaculture or those who are wanting to get involved in aquaculture, what's the best species for me to grow? I'm going to talk about the species that are suitable for growing in freshwater. There are many different ways to grow fish in freshwater. And apart from catfish, which grow in almost any kind of system, you need to consider which of the fish will perform best in your system. Before we talk about the fish, let's have a look at the different types of systems that people grow freshwater fish in. 
cage culture in freshwater is fairly common and is very suitable for some of the species that we're going to talk about today. Cages in ponds can be quite small cages in a large body of water or very large cages in a large body of water. A recirculating aquaculture system, or RAS, is an ideal system for some of the freshwater species. Another upside to the RAS system is that you can have the system close to your market. It doesn't use up very much space, in other words you don't need a lot of land. But on the downside, they're very expensive to operate and if any mistakes are made, it's usually financially disastrous. On the other hand, large open ponds are also ideal for some of the species, such as barramundi, silver perch and jade perch. Large open ponds are generally very inexpensive to operate. Stocking densities aren't so intense, so if a mistake does happen, it usually happens in, well, if you like, slow motion, giving you time to do something about the problem before you lose your stock. There are some species that will perform fairly well in a number of different culture systems. For example, jade perch will grow in large open ponds, in a recirculating aquaculture system, or in floating cages, but they outperform all other fish if they're grown in that large open pond. So you need to think about where your market is, how much it's going to cost to grow the fish, and are you competing with someone who grows the same species in a system that allows them to produce them quite cheaply. What you're looking at here is a petitioned aquaculture system, or PAS. Look it up on the internet. It's an interesting and very efficient way to grow fish. In this view, you can see one that's under construction. They're basically a series of raceways within a very large pond, and the aeration is outside the raceways or outside the actual culture area. I'm not really going to talk about salmon or trout here, because they're strictly cold water, and I don't know very much about them. All I can say is the best place for them is on the wall as a trophy fish. Barramundi is a species that can be produced or grown in a recirculating aquaculture system or in large open ponds or in cages. They require warm water, need to be graded frequently when they're young. The reason they have to be graded frequently is because they're extremely cannibalistic. Most commercial barramundi farms grade their smaller fish twice a week. But once they reach a certain size, they can be put out in a pond and left to do their own thing. Barramundi are one of the few fish that can be grown in salt water or fresh water. They say that the ones grown in salt water taste better. In fact, barramundi is one of the few fish that has an actual change to the flesh when grown in salt water. Now, this is a big fish. Whether or not you want to grow a fish to this size or not is another question. This is the Australian iconic Murray Cod. Strictly fresh water, an excellent eating fish, and it lends itself very well to aquaculture. One of the issues with Murray Cod is their reproduction. They generally only spawn once a year. Here you see us removing the eggs from a female ready to be fertilised with the sperm of a male. They're expensive to produce, therefore they're an expensive fingerling to buy. The upside is that these fish grow very big. A fish of this size is really only perhaps a late teenager, 19 years old by human terms. And that only takes them a year or two to get to three or four kilos. So a three or four kilo fish is really just a baby. They need to be kept condensed, that is to say, stocked quite heavily. 
If they're not stocked heavily, their natural predisposition to be cannibalistic is allowed to flourish. Like barramundi, Murray cod will eat each other if they're not graded regularly. In fact, a small Murray cod will eat one of its brothers and sisters its own size. The correct stocking density is very important. It helps to suppress the territorial behaviour, therefore the cannibalistic nature of the fish. Murray cod are not suitable for growing in an open pond. They are ideal for growing in cages, a recirculating aquaculture system or a petitioned aquaculture system. It should be noted that temperatures in the high 20s are very detrimental and will cause losses in Murray cod. In contrast, sleepy cod actually perform very well at high temperatures and hate the cold. In this picture you can see an extremely rare gold form of sleepy cod. I've only ever seen a couple of fish this colour, and only a few dozen have ever been recorded. Sleepy cod, similar to Murray cod, isn't really suitable for growing in open ponds. Ideal for growing in large sheds in a recirculating aquaculture system. However, very few growers have really tried this at commercial levels. This is not a beginner's fish. Apart from their cannibalistic nature, they are very difficult to wean onto artificial feed. Only a skilled, experienced aquarist should attempt this species. They are arguably the best freshwater table fish Australia has to offer. They command an extremely high price. In Asia, there is another fish known as the marble goby, and it too fetches extremely high prices. Now we come to the easy ones, the perch, silver perch and jade perch. Silver perch will tolerate much lower temperatures, but don't perform very well in enclosed environments such as a recirculating aquaculture system or in cages. We don't really know what the issue is with them growing in these environments because no research has been done. However, leading scientists in Australia believe that the fish may release a hormone into the water which causes the other fish to stop growing. In other words, we're really crowded here, we better not get any bigger. Jade perch, on the other hand, are suitable for growing in confined spaces. Stocking densities at quite high levels in a recirculating aquaculture system a petitioned aquaculture system or in cages they perform really well. They do however perform their best if kept in an open pond. The farmers in Queensland that have been growing these fish the longest have got it down to a fine art. Growing them in ponds is undoubtedly the best way to grow them. However, in Asia and Europe, even in America, Jade perch are grown in petitioned aquaculture systems and recirculating aquaculture systems quite well. The main thing to remember between the two species is the temperature differences. Silver perch tolerate cold water really well and jade perch really hate the cold. Although we're not dealing with the eating qualities in this part of our jade perch story, it is important to note the extremely high omega-3 content of these fish. I suggest that you research the omega-3 content of silver perch and jade perch. It's a great marketing plus. There are still a few other freshwater species that we haven't dealt with here today. Golden perch, for example, have been grown once and found to be an excellent table fish and grew quite well. Unfortunately, the grower that attempted to do this was unable to repeat the success that he experienced the first time. There are also a number of catfish available in Australian freshwater. These catfish have excellent eating quality. There is little or nothing known about how quickly they will grow, but I can tell you from personal experience they're great to eat. 
The other thing I can tell you about catfish is that they have an extremely wide temperature range. In fact, they tolerate the cold extremely well. The picture you're looking at now is of a, a very rare golden form of the Tandanus tandanus. There are so many different species available in Australia and very little known about their potential for aquaculture. This one, the honey perch as I call it, is also known as a sooty grunter. It has excellent eating qualities. I know it takes pellets, but we know nothing about its grow out potential. Some people have said that aquaculture is a little bit like being in jail. You have to be there all the time. But still, if you really like fish, it's a great way to earn a living.
This is where jade birds come from, their natural home, the Baku River in central Queensland. This part of Australia is very dry and arid. The river really isn't a river, it's only a series of waterholes. And during heavy rain in the northern part of Queensland, these waterholes are joined by quite a flood. This is where we collected our wild broodstock. The broodstock are used to mix with our lion bred fish. When it comes to producing jade perch fingerlings for the aquaculture grow out sector, it's important to be able to understand their natural habitat and what makes the fish breed. We need to be able to imitate this on our fish farms and in our hatcheries if we're to be successful at spawning jade perch. In the wild, male jade perch are ready to breed so long as the temperature is in the zone. That temperature zone is between 20 to 29 degrees Celsius. Here you see us catching a small jade perch, possibly a not. The females also come into breeding condition once the waters reach that temperature zone. The females will produce the eggs in their ovaries and wait for an environmental trigger. And that environmental trigger is flowing water or a flood. But before the fish produces the eggs, a few things take place. The water temperatures slowly increase over a period of weeks or months. The type of food available to the fish changes. In the colder temperatures, there's very little insect life around and not so much aquatic food apart from algae. Also, the jade perch is not so able to move around and catch fast moving food because of the lower temperatures. So as the temperatures increase, the fish are able to chase down and catch live food, such as other small fish or shrimp or little gabbies, crayfish, freshwater crayfish. This is where the broodstock we collected from the wild are being released into our wild broodstock pond. Now moving back to what I was saying about the fish's condition. So the food available to the fish changes. The fish is now able to catch moving prey because the water temperature has risen and it's able to move faster. So remember what I said earlier, we need to imitate nature. The ponds that you put the fish in need to be as close as possible to natural so that there's plenty of live food little freshwater shrimp small fish and minimize the competition from the larger fish the last thing you want to do is to feed them aquaculture pellets the aquaculture pellet does not imitate natural food it does grow the fish very quickly, which is ideal when you want to be able to grow table fish, but it is not what you want to do when you're trying to condition brood stock. The pond should have a water depth between one metre and two metres. Natural vegetation around the pond will encourage insects. These insects that fall into the water or breed in the water, so they have an aquatic stage of their life form, are an important part of the natural diet for jade perch, and vital for conditioning females to produce quality eggs. Now those eggs, when they're inside the fish, are called oocytes, or oocytes. 
and it's actually bringing us photo sites. Now looking at this part of the video, you can see that there's a lot of water movements. This is ideal for the fish, but not ideal to catch the brood stock. Some aquatic weed growing in the water is okay, but it also can create issues when you're trying to catch your brood stock when it's time to brood. Looking at this picture here, you can see the fish on the right, which is a wild fish, and the fish on the left, which is an aquaculture fish. That white mass that you can see inside the fish on the left is in fact fat. And if your fish are like this, you will not be able to breed them. The eggs produced by the female will be useless. They need to look like this fish. This one is actually out of the gill net on the bank of the Barku River in central Queensland. That's what you need to do to condition your fish. Imitate nature. They should not be fat. Only the female should have the fat fish. The male should look like this. Trim, taut and terrific. This fish, if it was a female, would be completely useless as a breeder. Looking at these two fish, male at the bottom and a female at the top, you can see the female is fat, but she's fat with eggs. The male is not fat. It is in good condition. Both of these fish are ideal for breeding. What you can see here is our crew at our farm in Australia netting a broodstock pond to select the breeders. When we catch the fish, we don't take them all back to the hatchery. We check the males to see if they're running, and if they're not, we throw them back in the pond. We look for fat bellies in the females, and if they have, we take them back to the hatchery, and then we look under the microscope to see how good their eggs are. I'll show you this in a minute. goes well, you'll have good eggs.
Ezra Archipalo.
Thank <laughs> you. 